Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him in a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. Here ends the reading of words that give us insight on God. May God grant us, grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Great God, who is the polar star of all those who wander, help us to know that even in the driest deserts of our lives, that there is a well around the corner if only we trust in you. May we find comfort in knowing that you have promised to journey with us and to never abandon us. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. You know, I'm convinced that uh, anyone who says that the Bible is boring has never read it. Especially when you look at scriptures like the one today. It's not boring, troubling perhaps, but not boring. Genesis in particular, but many books in the Bible, read like a sort of ancient soap opera, don't they? You're reading along and people keep making bad decision after bad decision. And just when you think that things can't get any worse, they do. It's quite a drama, and it's a lot of fun to read. Today's scripture reading is the perfect example of why we have to be careful when we interpret the Bible. If we were to take it literally, God would come off as unkind and even unethical. But if we look at the broader arc, we can see this story as a sort of birth narrative of two different religious traditions, and we learn something about God. Today's scripture lesson is a part of a larger story arc, and most of you know this story. It's the story of Abram and Sarai. Abram and Sarai are living in the land of Ur until God comes and tells them to move to the land of Canaan which they do. They travel for a long time, and they get there, and they grow older until Sarah is past her childbearing years. The text says that Abram was 86, and Sarah was nine or ten years younger than him, but we shouldn't really read those as actual numbers. We should read those as the Bible's way of saying that they weren't going to be having any kids. <laughs> People didn't live as long in the ancient world, and that was the Bible's way of saying they were old. I'm sorry for those of you who were 86 or over, but people didn't live as long in the ancient world. 
they weren't going to be having any kids. So Sarai tells Abram that she will give him her slave girl, Hagar, with whom he can conceive. Now that's troubling in and of itself, but they, they conceive a child together and she has a son, Ishmael. They've hit the jackpot. Okay, you don't want to have a daughter in the ancient world, and they've had a son. If you have a daughter, the daughter might not get the inheritance, won't carry on the family name, and worse than that, you have to pay a dowry to get her married. But if you have a son, you've hit the jackpot, because with a son, the son can carry on the family name, can work in the family business, and most importantly, can get the inheritance. Sarai isn't real thrilled, though. She sees Ishmael grow and becomes resentful. Then a few years later, when Abram is 99 and Sarai is 90, again, exaggerated to, to, for effect, God comes and makes a covenant with Abram, changes his name to Abraham and Sarai's name to Sarah and sends angels who tell them that Sarah is going to have a child. Understandably, they're a little doubtful about that, and Sarah laughs. But she does. She has a child, a son, whom she names Isaac. This is supposed to be a miraculous birth to show how important this child is going to be. But now there's a problem. Now that Isaac's around, what do they need Ishmael for? And Sarah looks at Ishmael, and every time she does, her blood begins to boil because she realizes that that's not her son. And so, one day, she sees Ishmael playing with Isaac. And that's where today's story picks up. I should note that this is evidence of multiple threads being woven together because today's story doesn't seem to know the verses ahead of it. Because according to the story I just told you, Ishmael would have been a teenager, but clearly in today's scripture reading, Ishmael is a small child. And Sarai sees Ishmael playing with Isaac and gets angry. Now, rabbinic commentators have said that perhaps Ishmael was being mean to Isaac, or perhaps he was jealous, but that's probably just rationalization for what was about to happen. Sarah goes to Abraham and says, you've got to get rid of them. Send them out. And Abraham is understandably a little hesitant to do that. I mean, Ishmael is his son after all, and surely he has some feelings for Hagar. And so he goes to God and asks God if he ought to send them out into the desert. And God says that he ought to listen to his spouse. Which I found is generally a pretty good idea. <laughs> In this case, it has dangerous consequences, right? Because he gives Hagar and Ishmael a loaf of bread and a flask of water and sends them wandering out into the desert. And wonder of wonders, it's not too long before that loaf of bread and water have run out and Hagar and Ishmael find themselves on their own out in the desert. The thread of hope is that we hear that God doesn't abandon them and provides for them even in the midst of the wilderness. That's a small thread of hope, though, isn't it? For them out in the wilderness, out in the desert? I think perhaps we should see this as a birth narrative, as an origin story that helps us gain some insight into two different religious traditions. Let me tell you what I mean. You probably know this, that the Judeo-Christian tradition traces its roots to Abraham through Isaac, while Islam traces its roots to Abraham through Ishmael. That's why we call Judaism, Christianity, and Islam the Abrahamic traditions, because they all look back to Abraham. 
And in Islam, they have a version of this story as well. In this version, Abraham doesn't merely cast Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert. Instead, he begins their journey with them, and he takes them to a certain spot in the desert that will become Mecca. He still goes back, and before long, Hagar and Ishmael are without food, as they were in today's scripture lesson, and without water. And so Hagar, in desperation, lays Ishmael on the ground and begins to look for water. And she sees two small hills. And she runs up the first one and begins to search for water. And she can't find any, so she runs over to the second hill and begins to look for water. And the story goes that from the tops of those hills, she could see Ishmael and see that he was okay. When she can't find water there, she runs back to one hill and then back to the other, and she does that seven times. She's so desperate, and she knows that this is her only hope to find any sustenance. But she can't find water. So she goes back to Ishmael, where she discovers that beneath one of his heels, water has sprung forth, and God is providing for her and for Ishmael. And so that place becomes a holy place. And Ishmael begins to grow and to become resilient. And eventually, Abraham comes back. And together, Abraham and Ishmael build a large cubic structure that's now known as the Kaaba. It's thought to be God's presence on earth as the Holy of Holies was in the temple for Judaism. So you see, when Muslims today go to Mecca, they're commemorating these stories. They go and run back and forth seven times between those hills, and then they go and visit the Kaaba. It's a way of looking back to Abraham and to Ishmael. You see, today's scripture lesson is an origin story. But what I find hopeful is that if we look at both stories together and remove the cultural favoritism that is placed in each, if we remove God's favoritism for Isaac and the Judeo-Christian narrative and remove God's favoritism towards Ishmael and the Islamic narrative, then what we get is a message of hope of God who never abandons people. Right? People in different religious traditions that God never abandons. And I think that's hopeful, because it's a message to us that no matter what is going on, God promises never to abandon us. God promises to be with us. That's hopeful in desperate times in our lives, when we might feel like we are alone. To know that even in the driest deserts, if we depend on God, there is a well of life. And it's also hopeful when we think about the state of our country and our world. You know, I often read through the ancient narrative and think it reads like an ancient soap opera. You know, one thing to the next. There's story after story, and as I said, things get progressively worse. And our country has kind of felt like that. <laughs> Lately, like a soap opera or a reality show or a three-ring circus where it's as if they're saying, let's see if the people will still tune in tomorrow. <laughs> and of course we do because it's not a soap opera, it's real life. But here's the hopeful thing. That no matter what is going on, God promises us that things will be better. God promises us that there is a well of life that will sustain us if only we hold fast to our faith and if only we rely on God to bolster us up. Friends, may we find that well of life in the desert. The well of peace, of hope, of joy, and of love. 
And may that embolden us to be God's people in the world. May it be so. Amen.